My phone is too heavy for this clamp. I had to restart the stream. If you're watching the previous stream, stop watching it. It's not live. Okay. Once again, this is the vault of the twice fallen. And, <clears throat> excuse me while I eat a pretzel. For um, all my Patreon customers, this is a map that goes up. I, I do a map every Friday. So this is the map that's going to go up tomorrow. <clears throat> and since we're all in this kind of a COVID-19 type thing, I figured I'd go live on Twitch in lieu of filming a video that I put on YouTube. This will also go on YouTube, but this way everybody else can see it too. But if you want to get a high-res copy of this map, just join my Patreon. It's only a buck. And you could pay more if you want, but uh, it's just a buck to get in. That gets you a map every Friday, high-res. Um, excuse me, that also gets you the map key. And the um, nice thing about that is uh, occasionally I post free maps, but they're not high-res. This is the high-res version. So um, when this map goes up, it'll be the high-res map with the that you can use for in your own personal campaigns. You can't, you know, use it, can't license it or anything. And then um, you can also have the key that goes with it. I, I intentionally keep all the keys generic. So in other words, it's, um, you know, this is a fantasy dungeon map, obviously, but it's not, it doesn't have to be for D&D 5e, it doesn't have to be for Pathfinder, it doesn't have to be for anything really specific. It's just, um, you know, this is the way I do my maps is I like to keep them generalized so that anybody can use them for anything, any kind of fantasy setting. And then the key is, you know, it'll say like this room is generally this and this is this and this, but nothing really too specific. Okay, let's get started. So the vault of the twice fallen and the, in, in my mind, the twice fallen are, are basically people who were killed. Um, so that's when they fell once and then they were somehow turned and reanimated back into the living dead and then killed again. So they fell twice, twice fallen. And then whomever didn't know what to do with the body, so they just put them in a big cart, took them down here and threw them in here for storage. And um, <clears throat> I don't know exactly what that means, <laughs> but that's something that you as the game master can come up with. Um, but that's what I wanted to do is create something that was kind of like a, a zombie storage area, you know, the vault of the twice fallen. And are these just bodies down in here or are they bodies that move? I don't know. It's something you're going to have to come up with, but, uh, and, and I intentionally kind of drew like the edges of all the hallways and everything really rough and jagged because I don't know, maybe that's just the way this place was constructed to begin with, or, or maybe uh, it had to be built in a hurry and that's why it looks like that. But we're going to get started today. I got my my cup of wine that I'm drinking. This is the Yellowtail Cabernet Sauvignon. And then I got my bowl of pretzels. Is it going to be chewing in your ears for doing this? Okay, so big sip of wine. So, as you can see, I've already started to kind of fill in um, the stippling. And I'll explain it as we go because there's a lot of stippling to do. And I doubt I'm going to get through everything um, today or tonight because I'm just doing this for an hour, but this will give you a good indication of how I do my stippling. And what we can do is we can come over to this section of the dungeon here. And as you can see, the stippling here is just one level of stippling. And what I do is I use um, Tombow pens. These are my stippling pens. And I have an entire other set. I'll show you that real quick. Where'd they go? My other pens are my microns. My microns are the ones that I do the line work with. So there's an entire different set of pens for my line work. And there's a pretty simple reason for that. Um, I don't like using the same pens that I do for lines to stipple with. Because when I first started, I used to, you know, I didn't know any better. And as I was drawing lines, and then I would use that same pen to go and stipple. When I came back and tried to do a line, the line would be all frayed because the tip of the pen would crush. So it took me a while to find a pen that I was happy with as far as the way the ink went down, the color of the ink, and some inks are reflective. The Tombos aren't, at least these aren't reflective. So I, I, I really like these. My wife got these for me for, I think it was my birthday. It was my birthday at Christmas. 
and I did they just they worked out perfect for stippling so I've always used them but I use an 01 an 03 and an 05 and I start with the big stuff so I started here with an 05 stipple so we get a nice big fat chunk that comes out and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my 03 which is the next smallest and if you've taken any of my classes, you know that what I'd like to do is like, I'll go out with the big stuff right against that line where I'm gonna start stippling. And then that gives me halfway. So the other half is gonna come out to here, say, with an 03. So it doesn't really look like it's that much of a difference, but it really is. So that's gonna be the full width of my stipple that goes all the way around. And then lastly, we're gonna finish up with the 01 and take that all the way across the entire width of that. So I'm just gonna back up and start right here. Make sure I'm in the frame here. There we go. Yeah. So, so I'm just gonna start step on away here. What I'm gonna do with the O3 is I'm gonna bring that in. And you see I'm filling in the white here. And then I'm going over the other big step. So I'm getting double coverage toward the black line there. And by the time we're done, there's going to be triple covers because as soon as I get to here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. We're going to have 05, 03, and 01. And there's no really rhyme or reason to this. I just kind of go at it. And I try to use some kind of a pattern, but a lot of times I'll break that pattern just to make something look a little bit different. Like, um, or maybe I want to put just a rock, big fat rock, right there. And then I'll go around the corner here, going all the way over to the edge. And then again, I'm double covering the 03 over the 05 to make it thicker towards the back. And that, that's already starting to look cool. But the neat thing about the 01 is the 01 is the thin pen. Really, really fine tip, as you can see here. So when I come in with the 01, that's when it kind of ties everything together. So the 01 goes over the 05 and the 03 all the way to the back. And I'm just, you know, I'm using numbers here, but if you want to do this, just get a pen, get three pens that you're going to stipple with and make sure one is uh, kind of a thicker pen, not quite as thick as this. That's a, called a brush tip pen. That's why I get that really thick line there but a thicker pen, a medium pen, and then a fine pen. And I'm using the fine pen now, and you can see I'll kind of bring it out. See how the small those dots are? They're a lot smaller than the rest of the stippling that goes in there. But when we start layering, this neat thing happens, and it just gives you this really cool gradient. I'm doing this kind of quickly, just so you can see. But here's, here's a finished result here. So you can see probably that this is a little bit whiter here. So I'm gonna go over here, fill in here, and I just kind of bring everything and blend it together. Yeah. But although I'm gonna try and work a little bit quicker, I'm gonna probably slow down because I know we're not gonna get through all this, but I want you to see kind of real time how I do this. Um, Cause I get a lot of questions about like, well, how do you hold the pen and how do you do this? Normally I'd hold the pen like this. And actually, I could do that without hitting the, the camera. It's probably a better way to do it. I try to go as straight up and down as I can. And then that way I, I has a, it keeps me from bending the tip over. And again, these tombos are pretty tough. So I tried other pens and I went to do the stippling and the shafts in them are plastic instead of metal like the tombos. So they crack right away and then it starts to go everywhere. And then you got a, a handful of black ink. So, and these aren't really super expensive pens. And they're not cheap, but I don't know, maybe 20 bucks for this whole set. So, it'll last you a while. And I've had these for, well, since November. Okay, so I've got 05 all the way around here, halfway out to the width. I'm gonna come out with my, I'm gonna stop calling 05, 01, no, all that. I'm gonna say heavy, medium, and fine because it's not going to make any sense because different pens have different numbers. 
So I'm going to come in with my medium pen now. Actually, I'm going to switch my glasses real quick because the glasses, I have like three sets of glasses. <clears throat> and that's just because I keep buying the wrong kind. But I wanted a pair that was just for artwork. And the pair that I'm wearing now is like my everyday glasses. And they don't, I can't really see as much detail. So now I got, yeah. Here we go, Superman glasses. We have another sip of wine. Mm. Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, okay. Where was I? So now I'm going to come in with the medium pen, which is my O3. <clears throat> and then you can see here, like, um, is that better be your hair? Yeah, it's a hair. I don't usually draw in the lines, but I noticed lately, because this is a grid, so I pre. I make my own grid paper and I pre-stress it, so to speak, so that the lines aren't really pronounced. Just because I don't like lines that just look like lines. Because then it just looks like, I don't know. I, I intentionally went in through, I made a grid, so each square is a quarter inch that goes across this way and this way on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And then I kind of stressed everything and antiqued it a little bit and then I took the percentage down to like 40%. So that when I print it, it's really kind of hazy, but I kind of went too far. But I like it because now I can I can actually go over these lines with my other line pens and do stuff like this, where you get this really cool room and you can put some stones in, you know. And I still have the grid there to work over, but then the black that I put down for the lines, I don't have to put a straight line, so it's a good guide. And then when I go to scan this, most of these lines are going to kind of disappear anyway. And then, of course, once I'm in, once I have this on Photoshop, I take a brush and I go and I paint out all this other line work here, so all this stuff in between will disappear. And it sounds like a lot of work, and I guess it kind of is, but it's fun. I don't know. I like doing it, and that's where sometimes, you know, when people ask me how to do this, and I, that's why I put the classes together. I, I have classes on Skillshare, so if you go to Skillshare. Um, Look up my name, Ted Foster, F-A-U-S-T-E-R, because I teach writing classes on there too. But um, the classes that I have for my dungeon drawing, um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put a link, and if you're not watching this on YouTube, go to YouTube, and then you can uh, get the link to, straight to my Twitch class, or excuse me, my Skillshare classes, and you can get two weeks of Skillshare for free. And this way you can take my class and a bunch of other people's classes, whatever you want, and, and then hop off and it won't cost you a dime. So, um, what was I going with this? <laughs> but um, a lot of people would ask me how to do this, so that's why I put that those classes together. But it's one thing to kind of take a class, and then it's another thing to kind of do something like this to where you can actually see me doing it and talking live. And um, one of these days, somebody will actually tune into my Twitch channel, and they can ask me questions, because I'm pretty sure the microphone's open, I think, or else the chat will pop up. Yeah, no one's in the chat room right now. So the only problem with doing my pen like this is that the camera wants to pick up on the pen, so I gotta kinda hold it at an angle. So anyway, don't do it like this. When you're doing it, do it straight up and down. Because if you're straight up and down, you won't put any pressure on that tip. I wish I could play some music too in the background. If you, again, if you're watching this on Twitch, uh, there's no music. And the reason is because I want to put these on YouTube also, but to put them on YouTube, if I were to put, like I was going to play, I usually do this to, um, there's a YouTube channel. I should put a link to that too. Uh, I think it's called Enverness and Enverness, not, not Inverness, like Ghost Tower of Inverness, but Enverness with an E. And they have all the music from World of Warcraft and um, Skyrim. I think Morrowind too. And um, what was the other one? But Skyrim, Morrowind, and um, Oblivion. And I usually put on the date, there's a daytime track and a nighttime track to Skyrim. And I just let that sucker roll. And it's got the do 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 do, you know. And that just goes for a while. And that's just really relaxing and it's fun to listen to. And I, I actually listen to that channel when I write too, when I write my fantasy. 
and uh, it's a lot of fun just to kind of chill out and put you in a mood but if I were to put that on now would it would sound really cool but oh hey there's people here how's it going hey my dude how's it going valiant chariot play it with Dalmi. what are you drawing I'm drawing a dungeon it's a dungeon this is the vault of the twice fallen so this is a map that goes out to all my patreons and it's going to be out Friday which is tomorrow and yeah so we're working on the stippling but um yeah if i were to put that music in now then i wouldn't be able to put it on youtube and um because youtube will ding you for that because you know they're going to pick up on i don't know they have some kind of magical algorithm now that picks up on um the different music that you put on they know what it is right away and they'll they'll de, you know demonetize and take off your your videos, although I don't monetize them. I've not played Dungeons and Dragons, but would seriously love to. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you got to. If you haven't, I mean, there's so many different, um, and there's so many groups now that'll help you. And in the situation that we're all in right now, um, there's, I mean, everybody's online practically playing because it, you know they can't do it in person now. At least they're not supposed to, I guess, do it in person. So you can find all kinds of groups that'll help you get out there and uh, learn and the, the one thing I've found because I, I live in Madison Wisconsin so we have of course game hole con that comes every year and then up in Lake Geneva there's Gary con uh, which sadly got shut down this year because of the virus but um, I always go to those and everybody is so nice and everybody will help you and everybody will teach you and you know no one's gonna give you a hard time or anything so I highly recommend it I highly recommend it from the UK. Well, that's harder because <laughs> I have a buddy in the UK and it was a six hour difference normally, pretty much. So yeah, um, we actually were gonna start a group online and it was six hours different. So when we were playing, um, it was like his dinner time and um, it didn't really work out. But, but I'm sure that there are plenty of people in the UK that will also play online and Sometimes it's almost better that way because you can, um, am I in camera? No, I'm not. Because online you can, um, I mean, nothing beats really, at least for me being in person. And I mean, I'm really old school. I'm in my fifties. Um, so when I was playing as a kid, we were, you know, sitting around smoking cigars and, you know, other stuff, I guess, sometimes. And uh, it was just that camaraderie of being in a room with other people was what made it so interesting and so much more fun that way. So online's still fun, but I mean, there's something about just being right there, you know? And that's why they have these big cons where people go to and they play all the time. And uh, we get a lot of people from the UK out here. I haven't really looked, yeah. I mean, it's, I wish I could recommend, I don't, I don't know a lot of places now, maybe someone who's on the chat could, could chime in here, but um, there's a lot of places. I think actually if you go to, to the Wizards of the Coast Online or the, the, the official Wizards Online presence, I think they have a connection to where they can hook you up and they can, you know, you can find other people to play with. Um, but yeah, the, the nice thing about online is you can do like maps like I'm doing. You can bring them in there digitally and then you can do what's called the fog of war to where you know like that's revealed and then as you go further this is revealed and then uh, the really good dms will cut up pieces of the maps digitally and then bring them in room by room and um that just makes it really cool and interesting and then you can actually you know i i foresee the day and maybe they might have this now but where we actually project the maps onto like a virtual game board and then everybody can literally have like their own little mini that they painted and they can put that on the map. But all, that one map is all joined together too. I think that would be cool. Because then you would basically be like you're right there playing D&D. But it wouldn't be, you know, you're obviously not in the same room. There's just endless possibilities. And we're in the, the infancy of what we can do, I think, with... Um, with virtual stuff right now. There's so much more we can do. So anyway, if you're just joining, um, what, what planet is this? 
<laughs> that was a one. I have no idea. A any fantasy planet. So, um, I just draw basically generic uh, fantasy maps that could be used for any system, so you can apply it to any planet, I guess. Um, but if you're just joining, what I, what I like to do is for my style that I teach in my Skillshare class, um, and then that I teach in person, is I use three different pens. So I use a heavy, a medium, and a light. And what I'll do is I'll start, you know, I've got the outline up here, which is a brush pen. And then against that, like say, let's say one square is my total width that I'm coming out. So one square here. I'll go half that distance with a heavy pen toward the line. Then I'll go from the total width all the way back with a medium pen. And then I'll do, do the same thing with a light pen. I'm on my light pen now. And I'm going kind of quickly, but toward the end, what I'll do is I'll take a light pen like this. And I hope you can see that. Um, and I'll get really close to that line, and I almost want that line to almost disappear and create this haze. And what that does is that gives you this just really cool gradient effect. Teaching it is even wackier. Well, you got that right. You got that right. It's hard to show. But, the, you know, the nice thing about this is I don't think I'm an artist. You know, everybody's like, oh, you you do these great maps. And I'm like, I guess, I don't know. I think there are people that are a lot better than I am, but um, you don't have to be a great artist to do this. This is stuff that when I was a kid, I used to do. And um, we used to do this with pencils in the spiral notebooks. You know, we'd literally take the line paper and just draw lines on it to make like squares. And then we would, you know, that's how we would do it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go, so I'm going to go back since we're here, I want to go up to this kind of stone brickwork, which I imagined as like when they built this, they reinforced certain rooms with brick. And these are the rooms that the twice fallen are going to be in. So I, I, I guess, uh, my thinking was that, um, there wouldn't be anybody burrowing in or burrowing out. So they keep all the dead in that way. So I'll go up to here with more stippling from the raw. So you'll see it all the way up to here. And then we can fill in uh, this room with some of the tiles and the, the stonework or, or stones that we can show. Can you explain any characters you play as in D&D? Me? I usually pay, play barbarians. I always like barbarians. Just because I like playing big, stupid characters that beat stuff up. And then... Um, the other character I always like to play, I, I like to play bards now, bards really, because bards are just, um, they've come a long way, and I think you can do so much more with them now, and you can have a pretty badass bard. So, um, and a bard is, you know, if, if you're not familiar with the game, uh, it's basically a character that is a musician, or a poet, or a writer, which doesn't sound all that interesting, I guess, but um, for me it's interesting, because I'm, I'm all of those, and... Um, it's finally about, you know, to me it's like, finally the creative types get to be badasses too, because usually they can specialize in a certain weapon too. And they're not the toughest by any means, like they're not barbarian tough at all, but uh, they're, they're pretty smart and they're usually pretty good with their specialized weapon. And they're usually pretty good talkers. So like the mouthpiece of your crew, that's gonna be a lot of times that's going to be a bard because they just know how to wit. They know how to talk their way out of stuff. So, yeah, bards are fun. Um, the character in mind for myself, I'm not really sure the roles of anything. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing is, is you, you don't have to. I mean, you can have a, it, and it depends on your DM too. Um, let me just explain this real quick. So we went halfway with the heavy pen. See that real thick pen? And now I'm going to take the medium pen and I'm going to go out to the full distance, which is essentially about the width of one square. And I'm gonna bring that all the way in against that heavy pen. So we're actually doubling up on that heavy pen too, it, which adds some gradient there and some depth, start to build some depth. But yeah, if you, it depends on your DM or your game master, depending on which system you're playing, but um, and what they will allow you to do, and everybody has certain restrictions. And the restrictions are, are there because people would just go crazy and build these unstoppable characters and then they would use the rules to their advantage and I've seen this happen time and again and then it's not fun it's just you know you have these you know 
fifth level characters that are destroying it, entire cities. And um, that's not fun. It's just not fun. I, I, truthfully, I like basic D&D too, where it's just, um, you don't really have much more than a fighter and a mage and a cleric and a, you know, a halfling. And um, weapons or swords and maces and daggers and, you know, you, you have to use your creativity to really accomplish anything and, and to, you know, be dominant over anything because there's not any, there's not a whole lot of special weapons and stuff. And, and that would be the, the purpose of an entire quest is to go after things like that. And then, you know, if you get a plus five bastard sword, that's like a big deal, you know. And if you play like that, it just makes it more interesting, I think. But that's me. That's me. Some people want to just, you know, hack and slash, and, and they don't want to get that involved in their gameplay, and they don't want to take that much time to, to grow their characters that much, and I totally get that. I mean, nobody has time anymore to do a lot of stuff. So it would make sense that you would want to play a game system, or at least some sort of uh, method that would have you get into the action quickly. But, yeah, you get it. I mean, that's just the way... Everybody has a different style, you know? Everybody has a different style. So we're getting into the brickwork now, and I wanted to kind of just pause here for a moment just to show you... When I say brickwork, these are giant stones, really, because in, in this scale, this is one... One square is 10 by 10. So this is pretty large. So you can see we've got slabs over here that are like you know, 12, 13 feet long. And again, I envision these as slabs that would go down to um, barricade these rooms in and make it harder to get in and out. Um, but when I started doing this kind of method where, because I'm going to put stippling around this, I'll show you over here the stippling that I have here. Um, here's the actual room. And then I've got that thick outline that goes around it. And I should probably do this so you can see better. But this brush pen outlines the room and then I build the brickwork off of that or stonework or slab work, whatever you want to call it. But then when I did the stippling, it would kind of get lost into the edge of the brickwork. Let's just call it brickwork. So what I wound up doing was coming in again lightly with the brush pen and just making kind of a shadow around. And again, this map is far from done. I got a lot of work to do tomorrow. But what I'll wind up doing is coming in and blending in this edge so it doesn't look straight. So what you will see in the finished product is an edge that looks more like a drop shadow, almost that goes around the side. And that's what we're going to do on the other side here. So you get to see that from the ground up. And it's, it's wine 30. Let me get a drink of my wine. Isn't that a cool glass? My wife made this. I'm going to show you without spilling my wine everywhere. She does pottery. Uh, so she made me some really cool mugs and glasses. And this was actually a... This cup was actually one that she considered like a screw-up. Like she didn't like the way it turned out. That's my favorite one. I, I drink wine out of this all the time. No, no, she didn't make the wine. She made the cup. <laughs> I used to make wine, actually. Well... I had started to learn how to make wine. I know how to make mead. I make mead everything. I have the carboys and everything and the bubblers to make mead. I made it a couple of times. It tastes like crap, but I'm gonna get better. Okay, so one thing I wanted to show you is this. This is a fine liner. And it says brush. And it's a big fat heavy tip. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because a brush tip is kind of angular and it's very very flexible and the methodology really is that you can do calligraphy with this so you can kind of when you're drawing you can bend it and move it around and swoop it and it looks like a brush um, this is from a dollar store and the reason I use this is because um, the original pens that I, that I put down these dark lines with originally were the Tombos um, but I like the effect that you can get with a brush pen and I have a tendency to kind of use it like a brush and if I were to use one of my Tombow brush tips like that a Tombow brush tips and most of the other ones that you're going to get that are the better quality of brush tips aren't going to be quite as flexible this is literally almost like a paintbrush most of them aren't like this 
and I, I didn't want to break them. So the neat thing about this is again, like I use this pen to make this dark line here, but I'm going to, I only want to get about half of that onto here. So I'm literally just going to kind of do this and you can see how it's kind of feathered because I've already crushed the tip a little bit just from using it. And I'm just brushing in and I don't have to be perfect. And if I accidentally go like, whoops, in there, see that one in there, big deal. I just go like that because I'm gonna come over this with stipple on the other side. That's the great thing about stipple is you really can't make a mistake. I mean, at some point, yeah, you're gonna stipple yourself into a corner, but um, generally speaking, that's why I started stippling because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't wanna, I started to realize that if I was doing other methods, like I tried, I tried the Dyson method where he does those really nice hatch marks and um, I'm just not, my hands aren't that steady. I don't, I don't like to, you know, use it as a crutch, but I have MS and um, sometimes it's hard to hold my hands steady. It's, it's actually why I started doing this is um, I wanted to keep my motor functions up and my fine motor skills. So uh, sketching allowed me to do that. But yeah, Dyson does great stuff. I mean, there's so many other people out there that are just better than me, I think. But I, I think I am, I think I'm pretty creative. You know, I think I can come up with cool stuff. So. Everybody's got their own different style. So I change my style all the time. It drives people crazy because they're like, well, can you teach me that? Can you teach me that? And I'm like, yeah, I just, I don't know what I'm going to be doing next week, but this is what I'm doing this week. But um, let's stop there for a second. Let's go into this room because this room is going to be cool. And what does that look like to you guys? I don't know. It looks like this might be, I don't know. Like when I drew this, I didn't know. I didn't know what I was drawing. I just kind of aesthetically looked at something and just started going with it and I kind of go into a, almost like a trance when I'm putting that stuff down. A throne room. Yeah. Yeah. Did you notice this? I just noticed this just now. The entrance into this room where there's going to be these are crypts here isn't lining up. Isn't that kind of funny? I think this whole dungeon, truthfully, is a, a rushed construction job. They put this all together and, and I don't know, maybe Maybe this is some kind of a throne or a worship room or something. Maybe there's some kind of ceremony that took place here. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe this is a ceremonial chamber that prepared or tried to prepare the body so that the twice fallen wouldn't be the thrice fallen. They wouldn't come back up again. You wouldn't have to kill them three damn times. So, who knows? But, a crypt. Yeah, like in Skyrim. Heck yeah, man. Skyrim's awesome. I don't know if you caught it before. I was talking about, I usually play the music for Skyrim um, when I draw, but for copyright reasons, I can't do that. Okay, I'm going to go into, excuse me, my Micron pens. My Micron pens are my better pens. So these, these are actually um, art grade pens. These are, uh, what do you call it, um, archival inks where they don't, they're UV uh, tolerant. They don't. And they say, like, tolerant, because eventually UV is going to destroy anything, but um, they hold up a lot better than regular inks, and they don't fade, you know, turn purple. Um, these are great pens. But I can draw a really nice fine line, because, oops, it's another thing. That's the other thing, too, is, like, you can see here, my thumb, that's the Tombow. If you use cheaper pens, and I did that, that would smear. But the Tombows dry really, really quickly. So you can, your, your stip work as you're going. I always, because I'm right-handed, I work right to left. Um, so I'm making sure that, um, excuse me, left to right generally, because this way I'm not um, dragging my hand across anything. But it just so happened that I happened to be working this way this time, so. But I don't have to worry about it, because um, now the brush, I'm just kind of like subconsciously programmed, I guess, not to, like, the brush pen will, will smear like crazy. It probably won't. It's not going to smear now because it's been a while. But right away, if you put that down, and then if you were to go drag your hand across it, because uh, it's a cheap dollar store pen, it would smear. So you, there are some risks to certain pens, but it's really hard to see, but there are uh, little fine hairs that come off of this too. I just, I don't know, I like the way that looks. But anyway, so back to this room. Um, again, this is grid paper that I create myself and print out myself. But, um, and this is working out well because this was actually a little bit too light. But I like the way it's light. It's got the spaces in between here. And I, I did that. It took a long time to just kind of knock out the, the centers. 
of lines that I put together in Photoshop and then I changed the, um, what do you call it? The transparency to where it went. And I think it's like 40% black. So it gave me this really nice light gray. But now what I can do is I can take these pens, my microns, and then I can come in and kind of just do this. And I'm not drawing in everything. I'm just kind of skipping it. And what this does, is this gives it just a nice rough look. And I'm, I'm using that gap in between. I always kind of look at, even though, I mean, if you're going through a dungeon, it's not gonna have slabs of concrete like this, but when I was younger, I used to work in concrete and concrete coating. So they have what's called expansion joints uh, in between slabs of concrete so that the floor doesn't crack. And then um, I thought, well, maybe that's what this is. And they would always have these weird like in the corners of expansion joints, but always seem to do this weird, like, space. So I just, I don't know, I like the way that looks, but now I'm just gonna draw this line. I'm not gonna get too dark. And I follow every line that's in there. And if you notice, like, even there, there's a little line there, because I wanna make sure that, yeah, construction-wise, um, there's probably not uh, a lot of really detailed work that went into this dungeon or this this construction and by dungeon it's kind of a generic term too you know generally speaking and the, uh, the term dungeon was a space underneath the castle where you put prisoners and uh, called it undercroft and things like that and it became a term in, in tabletop that we used to describe monster layers so let me catch up on this maybe it doesn't line up because uh, it isn't man-made hey I like that. You got some good ideas there, uh, Valiant Chariot. <laughs> maybe not symmetrical because that back part isn't the main focus. Maybe it's behind a hidden wall or a caged area for animals and monsters. You got a, it's some creativity going on there. You should be doing this. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff you want to be thinking about as you're drawing this too. Because the, the, the other thing too is if it's too pre-planned ahead of time, it just feels like you know, it's kind of a dungeon by committee kind of thing. And I like to just kind of come up with stuff, crazy stuff, and feel it. As you're drawing, you know, it's kind of like the feeling comes over you. And then it's like you get these ideas and get these really cool ideas. And then you can, you know, kick them around in your head. And most of the time they're going to change because as you get partially through the dungeon, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, but what about this? And what about this? And maybe that. You know, like we called this a throne room. It could be like, it'll probably change 13 times by the time I'm done with it. Um, but I'll stop right there just so I can show you what I'm gonna do with this room now. So you can see that the, I, I call them floor tiles. And here's, isn't that cool? I just run my finger across it. The floor tiles in there um, are just plain. So they're, they're a little bit, you know, the lines are broken up to where it looks a little bit rough. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my stippling pens, and it's really easy just to take this Micron, which is my good expensive pen, and start doing this, but I don't want to break these tips. So I always keep my separate pens for stippling. So I'm going to start with an 05, which is my heavy pen, and I like to put my heavy rocks down first. So then I just look at the room, and I'm like, mm, rock goes there. Mm, big blob goes there. There's a big blob here. There's two big blobs there. That's about it, because I don't want to crowd it up too much. Um, what are the side paths with the circle rooms? I don't know, but I, I think I think this one right here is the entrance. That's about as far as I came up with right now. What I'm thinking, what I actually thought of doing, and if you play Skyrim, I'm going to make these rooms with niches in them, in the walls, so that there's like stacks of bodies in here. And then these rooms I'm going to reserve for like, almost like the what would have been the royalty or uh, you know the, the warrior undead that were almost impossible to take down on the battlefield and they, they showed them some respect by giving them more crypts like that so yeah so that's a that's kind of what I envisioned these rooms being here but actually what I'm probably going to do now that I'm looking at it, this is this is where I talk about I change stuff all the time see this right here when I do this I usually put those in for stairs I think we'll just leave them the stairs because what I'll do is I'll have the stairs coming down and this would be one of the main um, niche rooms in here. So the, 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 
the circumference of this room will have niches cut in, like shelves cut into the walls, and then stacks of the dead piled in there. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. I'm glad you asked me that because I hadn't, hadn't really thought about that until this time. But let's get back to this room. So we got three big boulders, and there's a couple different ways to do boulders. Actually, there's a lot of different ways, but let me make sure I have my small fine pen. But I like to do almost like a circle with the pen to show that it's a big boulder. And then the ones that are actually black dots, but bigger black dots are just bigger stones, but they're not as big as those big boulders. And it sounds like nitpicky, but when you when the eye looks at it quickly, that works. I've found that that really works. And then also what I've found that works is if you have a big stone, you usually have couple smaller stones around it. Same with these dark stones here, but not too much. And then in the corners, because nobody ever cleans the corners, right? Not that anybody cleans a dungeon, but not every corner, but some of them. I'll just put some schmutz, you know? And then the center of the room, and not right in the center here, maybe over here, maybe over here, here. That's about it. And you probably can't even really see that, but when this scans in at uh, the full resolution, you'll be able to actually zoom down in on the map and you'll be able to see all that detail, which I think is really cool. So, be great for a horde of gelatinous cubes. You know, more wine. A gelatinous cube is the first thing that killed me. Oh, that's good wine. Um, yeah, that's when I first started playing D&D. And um, I didn't know anything, you know, and my DM, to his credit, wouldn't let us, this is when, you gotta remember this is the 80s, so D&D was still kind of new. And um, in the late 70s and early 80s, the only people that were really playing D&D are the people through, from Pennsylvania through Wisconsin. I know I'm gonna get a lot of flack for that because New York is another hotbed for it, but I mean, there were like pockets of places where people played D&D. And so I didn't know anything about the monsters, you know? I had no idea what a gelatinous cube was. And the way he played it was so perfect. Because it, he was, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he was describing this room. And you gotta remember, these are basic characters. So these are like level one characters. So I think I might've been playing a thief, which, you know, basic D&D had thief, and that was it. They didn't have rogue and, you know, cutthroat and, cut person, all these other different uh, variations of a thief. So, I mean, thieves were really weak. They were just really super weak. And they would die easily. Um, and I think my weapon was a dagger. I had like a long dagger. That was it. So I'm a little thief. I think I might have had five hit points with a dagger. And I'm like, I was smaller. I remember that. So I was at the, the front of the marching order. And I do remember this. However, he had described it, he was pen drawing out. There we go. He had described it as there's a room in front of you that looks like it's filled with a green haze. And I was thinking, oh, cool. That's so cool. You know, because like if you've never played a, any kind of role playing game and then you're actually doing that you're actually it's hard to, it's so hard to describe but like when you're playing a character for the first time playing a role-playing game and you, someone describes something just as simple as that and you don't know what the hell it is and you don't know what's going on and you don't know what you're supposed to do it's just cool it feels like you're living inside of a movie and that's the way D&D started for me I mean that's why it got me hooked and that's what got me into writing and that's why I wrote all my World of Fate Rel books and everything, and they eventually got me into role playing even deeper and deeper, and then got me into doing cartography. Yeah, it does that to you. So I, I, I guess I have this gelatinous cube to thank for that because the room was 10 by 10. And in the center of the room was treasure. So of course, I'm thinking, I'm just gonna go rush the treasure go grab the treasure, be the first one to the treasure, you know, and, and I didn't even understand how D&D worked back then. And I, ran, I rushed into the room and I ran smack dabs with my face right into a gelatinous cube. 
And of course, I failed my saving throw and I got sucked into it and I died. That was it. <laughs> it was like, it was like maybe five rooms into the dungeon. And that's, you know, it, it taught me a lesson too, because it taught me the lesson that, you know, if you're gonna play these games, you can't, you know, can't be greedy and you can't rush ahead and you have to work as a team kind of thing. That's the, the, the great thing about role playing is that teaches you too. So. Yeah, it sucked. But you know what? I didn't get really, I didn't get really hooked on that character because, I, I mean, to this day, I don't even know what his name was because he lasted all probably half an hour. And then at the time, we didn't know, like, because everybody was new playing D&D. &D. We didn't know that, you know, you should probably have backup characters ready just in case somebody dies, especially if you're low level. So for hours, I sat there going, can I play again? And it's like, no, you're dead. You know, it's like, <laughs> I didn't have a character. I was... I had to do nothing for hours. It's, it really, again, it taught me that lesson. Don't be greedy. Don't rush ahead. Play as a team. But it was just, again, that, that feeling that... Even, even the, the way I... You know, the death was, like, so cool. And, it, and he described it, like... You know, in this great, gory detail, too, which was just freaking awesome. So I was like, what? And he used to do this thing, too, where, like, he wouldn't tell you it's a gelatinous cube. He would tell you how you died, or he would tell you what you were fighting. Like, if you encountered something, he would describe the monster, and he wouldn't tell you anything about it. And you wouldn't know anything about it, because nobody could afford... I think they might have had monster manuals back then, but nobody could afford them. Except for, you know, the DM, who was the guy that had everything. So he would describe what was happening in the battle and what the monster could do, and you know, and you're like, oh crap, it does that, and oh, this didn't hurt it. What do we do, you know? And then when it was over, he'd be like, you just faced a carrion crawler, you know? And then we would have to kind of remember as we went, and there were so many monsters that it was just cool. It was like, it was like going to the Star Wars films for the first time, and you know, you see like a a snow speeder. You're like, what is that? You see how it flies around and what it does. And you're like, oh, that's cool. And now there's everything online that tells you everything about a snow speeder and how it's made and the company that made it and who manufactured it and how, how much it weighs and this and that, you know. And that's fine. But there was a lot of just, there was something special about not knowing. That having no idea how something was going to turn out. I know my hand's in the way. I'm sorry for that. It's kind of hard to film like this, but I don't. I, I go back to like doing up and down, which screws up the camera, so I have to do this. Um, so now I'm going into the medium pen again. So I put all that heavy stipple down. I'm taking my medium out. I'm gonna go over the white space and then back over the, the heavy pen because I want to build up that gradient. And we'll go to the end here and I'll probably wrap up the stream for tonight. Um, once I get the fine stuff down, so I'll put the fine stuff down. So, if your character trait was greedy, it was natural for him to go for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that, you know, that's a, that's a good point because a lot of people forget that when you're role playing, you're role playing. And there's two ways to do that. You can have um, your characters that people display as, the, as they would themselves, or I think it's a lot more fun when you actually do the role playing portion of it to where your character would not do something out of character. So if, if my character were greedy, then yeah, I would have rushed that treasure anyway. So there's really no way I could have prevented that to, to a certain extent. It's not that I would do that every single time I saw a treasure. Um, but if, you're, like if your treasure is chaotic evil, or your treasure, your character is chaotic evil, and then um, you do something that was, you know, lawful neutral, that's where the DM would have every right to go, you know, no, I'm gonna cause shenanigans. Your character would not do that. Your character would hack that guy's head off. And that's the fun part of it because to a certain extent, it's like you're controlling another character in another world. So it's not really you now. It's like you're playing that character and that's, that's true role playing. That's where that comes from. So, and that's the fun of like, it's like you, you prepare yourself as a certain character and with certain expectations that that character would do, but then you never know the situation that's going to pop up. And in, some, in many instances, you're, you're locked into what your character, what the actual character and not you 
would do. That's what makes it a lot of fun. And I've played both ways. I've played where, you know, but I don't know. I guess I, I look at it and I can see it from both sides. You, you know, you're going to have a really nice barbarian. I had a barbarian one time at Swope Poetry. He was still a badass. And he had like, um, he, he wore chain mail, but it wasn't chain mail. Um, <coughs> excuse me. More pain. It wasn't chain mail. What he did was he had links of um, chain embedded in his skin and that was his armor so he was just a badass and he carried this around all the time and um i think he used an axe and a hammer and artan his name was artan i remember that but he also was very well spoken and very well read and educated and, and wrote poetry so he was one of my favorite characters artan So, but that's where I, and I played him as a person, you know, like me. So it's like, I, we would come up with the ideas for our characters like that because we actually wanted to play a character like that. And then we, we acted like we were in a play and this is our character that we were assigned for that play, so to speak, kind of thing. So I guess it was like role playing, but we would come up with our own unique roles that we would do. So you, you could have a thief, it was actually more like a Robin Hood type character, or you can have a barbarian who likes to pick flowers, I don't know. Or you can have a milkmaid who was totally, uh, you know, bloodthirsty and liked to, to, I don't know, torture elves, you know. But otherwise was a really nice person, that kind of thing. That's where the fun of it comes in. That's where you can come up with all different kinds of variations that make the game interesting. And that's where, you know, I don't like to kind of stick to the rules too much because then you can get trapped by the rules and then it just gets boring. And it, then it's like a card game. Not that there's anything wrong with a card game, but just uh, tabletop games should not play, in my opinion, like card games. They should play like tabletop role-playing games. And, and, uh, or TTRPGs should not play that way, at least. So, I'm sorry, I've been totally ignoring the chat here. Lives in his skin, he must have had a magnetic personality. <laughs> uh. Do you also draw your own characters? Oh God, no. Yeah, I'm horrible with that. I've tried. I should probably take some classes. I can't do faces. I can't do faces. And I have really, I have a trouble, I have a lot of trouble with hands. I could do feet really well with boots and stuff like that. And I could draw all the armor like a knight. That's one of the easiest things I think to draw because it's got a helmet on, you know, it's all covered up. But like, and if it's a monster, I can run with all kinds of cool stuff. But I'm, I'm also not very good at shading. So that's where there's people that are just so much better than me and stuff like that. And I stick to what I, I like. And there's a weird kind of, I don't know, there's something about doing stippling for me that's just relaxing. I could do this all night. Speaking of which, I should probably hop off here. Thank you guys for watching. Really, it's been really fun doing this. And uh, my hand's getting a little tired, so I'm gonna stop now. But um, Again, tomorrow, um, that's, this map will actually be up on my Patreon. So if, you want, if you're into that thing, you can get on my Patreon for a buck. Uh, if you want to pay more, you can pay more. But every, you get everything for a dollar a month. And uh, every Friday, they crank out a map. So it's a fresh map every Friday. And you can just look for me as Ted Draws Dungeons on Patreon. And then this map will be on here. But yeah, I got a lot to do. But you can, I'm trying to get this a little bit closer and kind of see what we accomplished. Isn't that cool? And again, I'm going to play with this a lot more. I'm going to add a lot more depth to it. And then if we go to the other side of the dungeon, you can see that I've got some tunnels that cross underneath here. And you can see I just basically started with lines that I thickened up. That gave me my... And then the rooms that were more squarish, I reinforced with stone. Yeah. So. Thank you for the stream, Ted Foster. Thank you very much for being here, you guys. I really, really do appreciate it. I have a lot of other stuff that you could be doing, and um, it's an it's an honor, really, to be able to do it this with you guys. So, okay, um, I'll see you guys next week, Thursday, 7 p.m. Central Time, where I'll be drawing another map. Have a good night. <laughs>